Well, good morning and praise the Lord. So good to see you here in the house of the Lord on this Sunday after Resurrection Sunday. And appropriately, we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit today. And so we are so grateful that you're here. Uh, Jesus gave the disciples clear instructions to go tarry in Jerusalem, uh, wait for power that will be endued on them from on high. And so we're excited that you're here today. And uh, we're going to set the stage by calibrating our hearts to Jesus right now, clearing away the distractions and focusing our heart on the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So as we enter into a time of worship, I just ask that you would fix your gaze, as A.W. Tozer said, fix your gaze upon the Lord and cast your burdens and your cares upon him and look to Jesus. Let's worship him. Let's open up our mouths and raise our hands and enter into his presence. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to worship the Lord this morning. Just think about his goodness and his faithfulness. Your worth, I wanna bring you more than words. I enter the 
Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint. Let every nation shout of your faith. Jesus is coming soon. As we prepare our hearts to give this morning, just want to give a heartfelt thank you for your generosity, your sacrificial and timely giving allows us to move the ministry of the church forward, it allows us to pay the bills, it 
allows us to uh, fix those unforeseen repairs that come down the road, untimely things. But thank you so much for your faithfulness unto the Lord. And the Bible says God uh, loves a cheerful giver. The scripture says, give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, till your cup runs over. For the measure that you give will be the measure that you receive. See, the Bible talks a lot about reciprocal. If you forgive, you'll be forgiven. If you give, God will take care of you. And I can tell you, 20, 20 some odd years of serving the Lord, and even in the times when uh, things were lean, God always provided for us. He always provides for his church. He always provides for his people. No matter how many times in my life, I can recall one time the air conditioning unit blew up and they came to repair it and they said, it cannot be redeemed any longer. And I thought, oh my goodness, $7,000. But we were blessed because they had a, Wells Fargo had a interest-free payment plan, but it still was gonna cost $262 a month for two years. And I thought, oh boy, uh, for a period of time, peanut butter and jelly was on the menu. But let me tell you, God was faithful. He allowed us to work our way through those 24 months and then to get to the end of that payment and say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Now we have a little bit of extra to go out to dinner, to maybe go on vacation, to give to the Lord. But I've always put the Lord first. And I want to encourage you, keep the Lord at the forefront of your financial aspect of your life. As the Bible says, wherever your treasure is, there is your heart. So when I look at my checkbook, I say, you know, the Lord still has my heart 23 years later of serving him. So I want to encourage you. It will develop your relationship so much deeper as you trust the Lord in the area of your finances. You can give today if you're watching online through our website, text to give. You can use the kiosk in the hallway. There is a box in the hallway. Many people mail in their checks. Many people give reoccurring online. If you'd like to do that, you could set that up online. So if you don't see someone come down here, it doesn't mean that they don't give. It means they probably use another vehicle to give. Amen? So let's pray. Father, thank you for the seed and the sower. I thank you for your goodness and your mercy. I thank you, Lord, for you are a giving God and you take care of your people. Continue to bless us as we move forward in your timing and your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.
generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you he is with you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming in your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for us he is for you he is for you he is for you he is for you take a moment to just put your eyes on Jesus. Lord, we just come to you today. We dare not end this time of worship without surrendering our all to you, Lord. We lift our hands and our hearts to you, Father. We're so thankful and grateful for everything you are in our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We lift you up this morning.
He's the name above all names. The name above all names. Worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our praise. Let your heart cry out. And my heart will sing how great is our God. Oh, Lord, you are great. Father, we just bless you today. We thank you for the resurrection of your son. We thank you for the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the operation of your word, which washes and cleanses us. We thank you for your church, the bride of Christ, Lord, which is the agent which you've chosen to sanctify and save this earth, Lord. I thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes away all sin. Holy Spirit, today, empower us. Comfort us, help us, provide wisdom and knowledge that we need to maneuver through the valley, through the mountains, through the wilderness seasons, Lord, the different places that life takes us, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to be our source of strength and encouragement as we navigate through life's ups and downs and all arounds. And I pray, Lord, you would, you would tool us with the word and by the spirit to help us process the ups and downs of life. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your presence here today. 
for in your presence there's fullness of joy. We're grateful for your activity in our lives, Lord. We give you priority today, Lord, as we seek your face. I pray that you would speak to your people today as you spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, as you spoke to Paul as he was thrown off the horse in Acts chapter 9 and had an encounter with Christ. May we have those unique encounters with you, Lord. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you turn around and greet a few people? Say God bless you and good morning. Good morning, church. Praise the Lord on this wonderful Sunday after Resurrection Sunday. It's so good to see you today. We've had an eventful week. Oh, my goodness. We had the launching of the Naaman Center on Thursday. Just an amazing time together. Let's just thank God for that. So it does look like they are taking in clients. Uh, and the grant, I, I guess the opening would probably be towards May 1st the first week in May. So I know a few people have called and they have appointed them more than likely to May 1st. So we're excited about that. Our Living Free is on Monday nights. Jeremy and Hannah got married yesterday. Amen. They'll be leaving for their honeymoon. Uh, but we have another great announcement that I've sent out to you. I didn't tell you what it was, but uh, you know, as the church is growing, uh, as we're reaching numbers, uh, in, the, in the near 400 mark and you know numbers don't always equate to health but it's our role as the leadership to put in things in place so the church does become healthy and holy amen I think uh, sometimes the models that are out there show numerically that oh if we have a thousand we're healthy and we're growing you may be growing but that doesn't mean you have spiritual health so we're blessed to announce to you today that we're bringing on staff as an assistant pastor uh, Pastor George Valco. Pastor Valco, will you come up? And so we're honored. Bob, one of our elders, Denise, you could come on up. We are honored to have Pastor Valco. He'll tell you a little bit about him, his ministry. You may know him because he, you, uh, he quarterbacks the Living Free. He's the director of the Living Free program on Monday nights. But he comes with a wealth of knowledge and experience. And uh, as he's transitioning, him and his wife, Ruth, Ruth couldn't be with us today. She's sick. Keep her in prayer. They were out watching the grandkids play baseball, and it was about 30 degrees. So, Ruth, if you're watching, God bless you. We're praying for you. But, Pastor Valco, I'll give you the mic and tell us a snapshot of your life, your ministry, and how you feel the Lord called you here. Well, praise God. It's good to be here. Thank you, Pastor. And I, I just all I can say is, wow, wow. I'm feeling overwhelmed in a good way. How many know you can feel overwhelmed in a bad way, but you can feel overwhelmed in a good way? And uh, what a week this has been. I agree with you. There was a TV program back in the 60s called That Was the Week That Was, where they reviewed everything. And I'm reviewing just this week. And last Friday, Good Friday, I preached my 27th consecutive Good Friday service as I've been in South Philadelphia as the senior pastor uh, for 22 years of Calvary Temple, a great historic church down in South Philadelphia. And then we merged with another church and I continued on for five and a half years as an assistant pastor and associate down there, uh, working in a similar role that I'll be working here. And so, but every time I, uh, Good Friday was mine. So I think about that. And then how timely, because you couldn't plan this. You know, I've heard people say, and you've heard this saying, the devil is in the details. Come on, how many have heard the devil's in the details? I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. God is in the details if you're walking in the spirit. God is in the details. Let's focus on it that way. And, and just uh, I, I just couldn't be more blessed to see how God has coordinated things. The opening of the Naaman Center, we, you know, so as we're making the transition, last Sunday, my last Sunday at Calvary Temple slash City Life Church, 
after 27 and a half years, and then this week going into this week, and Jeremy getting married, what, I mean, all in the same week, and Jeremy was my worship leader, and I sent them all to you, actually. <laughs> sent them to you, and, and everything worked out. And uh, just, just thinking of, um, I think it was about a year and a half ago, you asked me to preach, and I was preaching, and I was mentioning, I referred to the fact that just about five minutes from here, when your wife works, actually, it's strange, the Honda place there, uh, was it, I'm going to have to get this name, Ogle, Ogle Town, Ogle Town Road. But there was a branch center of Philadelphia Teen Challenge there on the same footprint of the Honda dealership. And I preached my very first sermon, 17 years of age, right there where the Honda dealership is now. And I still remember the text that I preached, Sirs, we would see Jesus from John chapter 12. And that's a pretty good text. I don't know that I've preached a better one since. But uh, just all of that to say, and I mentioned Teen Challenge, and you heard that, yeah, I heard and it. it clicked in your spirit, right? Uh, yeah. And you said, well, we had a Teen Challenge. We need a Teen Challenge because God has already been stirring your heart. So those are the details that God was in. And then uh, we, we connected spiritually about the Living Free Center, drawing upon some of the knowledge I had, and that's been such a blessing. And Bob and others have been working there. So, I mean, here we are. And so we're just so happy to be able to be used of the Lord. And uh, I wasn't going to say this, but I could just say this one thing. Uh, about maybe a, a few months ago, the Lord spoke to me and said, you no longer have the mantle of Joshua. You have the mantle of Caleb. That means I'm old. <laughs> But Caleb and Joshua stood together. So I just want to say you have a pastor who has the spirit of Joshua, and, and he has got the vision, and God has anointed him. And I'm just so thrilled and happy to come alongside to be Caleb, and we're going to conquer the land together. Amen. Amen. We're just going to take a moment. Would you stand with me? We're in, I'm going to have one of our senior leaders, Bob Phillips, our treasurer, pray over Pastor Valco. My wife, Andre, is on the board, so we could just extend our hands for this next season of his life for a time of fruitfulness, faithfulness, and everything God has poured into him, allow him to pour out to us in this community. Thank you. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Hallelujah. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can lift our hands and place our hands towards Pastor Valco and welcome to the body of Parkview. We thank you, Lord, for the time that he's been here at Living Free, for the leadership and guidance that he's provided as we've ministered to others as they've struggled through some difficulties of life. He has shown himself and proved himself to be a worthy servant, O oh God. We pray, Lord, that you continue to bless him, to anoint him as he moves forward here in the body of Parkview, that, yes, we may be a church ready for you. Amen. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that, yes, he works in complement of the staff here for the edification of the body to welcome new believers as they come in to show your love, to present your glory, your grace, and your kindness. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, for his wife, Ruth, yeah. who couldn't be here this morning. Give her a touch and body. Lord, just bring health and healing to her that she may be here in our next service that so we can all greet her and welcome her into the body. Lord, bless them. Use his time, talents, and gifts, Lord, abundantly. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 So, hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Bob, Denise, Andre. We're so thankful that he's here with us. Uh, you can't write a better script. I mean, you can't make that up. One simple visit, and then the teen challenge, the recovery aspect. Uh, it just God is in the details. I'm just so humbled. This was Pastor's first week with us here. What a blessing. Uh, he'll be looking over pastoral care, hospital visits, home visits, things of that nature, funerals, uh, all those details. Uh, discipleship, new believers classes, the people that have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior to be able to have a game plan to follow that up. Absentee people that have maybe slipped through the cracks. A whole various aspect of ministry uh, that he'll be able to take care of behind the scenes as the church is growing. Amen? So we're excited. A couple other announcements. We have the Young Adults this Friday, the 12th at the Dream Center. We'll provide food and fun and fellowship at 7 to 10. 
no sign up necessary. Now next Sunday, if you're new to Parkview and you come to the 8.30 service, after the 8.30, we invite you down to the prayer room or the conference room, whatever you like to call it. There'll be some uh, pastries and some coffee. I'd like to get to know you. Pastor and Denise will be with me and some of the staff. We just want to say hello, get to know you on a first name basis. And also at the 10.30, following the 10.30 as the kids' church empties out, we'll have what's called pizza with the pastors. And so if you're new, if you've been here, don't come for just the lunch. If you're new and we want to get connected and say hello to you, get to meet you, hear your heart, ask us the questions. Uh, I'm always here, just so you know. People say, you're busy, I can never get to you. Uh, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I am here at the end of the 8.30, and at the end of the 10.30, I'm right here. I'll pray for you. If you need something more, I'll give you my email, my cell phone, if you need to connect during the week. If you need an additional pastoral care, pastors here will work that out. But we're here at the altar after the service to connect with you if you need us for anything. Amen? Just want to make that clear. Bake sale will be next week on the 14th. The youth will be doing a bake sale uh, to raise funds for the summer camp. And then the Passover Seder is going to be the 17th. That's uh, about a week and a half out. We have about 60 or 50 people signed up. Please sign up uh, before that fills up. And that will take place Wednesday night, the 17th. There will be uh, no service in here. Only downstairs, the Passover Seder. The youth will be at the Dream Center that night. And then coming up on Wednesdays, we're bringing in uh, our dear friend Matt Muscatel from uh, Encounter Freedom Ministry. And we're going to do four Wednesdays of evangelism training. And this will help you uh, be able to share the gospel. He'll give you a booklet. Uh, that'll be April 24th to May 15th. Four consecutive Wednesdays on evangelism training because Hope Day is coming down the road on June 8th. More information on that to follow. And then if you're interested in becoming a member at Parkview, we do have an application process in place now where you fill out the application online and it's properly vetted. And then we'll get back to you to determine if you need uh, a foundations course or you could just segue right into the, into the membership course. We want you to uh, have a good foundation. For those that are new in Christ, we want to encourage them to take the foundations course and we'll help them navigate through that. Amen? Are you ready for the word? All right, let's stand and open up our Bible to Acts chapter 1. Uh, the resurrection was last week, the story of Jesus being resurrected from the dead. And now when I was growing up, it wasn't called Acts of the Apostles. It was called Acts of the Holy Ghost. In my Bible, in my grandma's Bible, and uh, the only other ghost I knew was Casper, the Holy Ghost. He wasn't a Holy Ghost, but, uh, but I learned about the Holy Spirit and the things of the Spirit. And today, we're going to focus our attention on the Holy Spirit, His roles, His responsibility, His activity in our lives. Acts 1, verses 1 through 8. Luke writing, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach, until the day he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, whom he also presented himself alive, after his suffering, by many infallible proofs, being seen by them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, verse 4, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now, so don't go anywhere. Therefore... When they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father, only the Father knows, which the Father has put in his own authority. Verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And for what reason? For you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea. Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let us pray. Father, 
Thank you for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I thank you you give us the unction to function through the gifts of the Spirit. Now, Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts today through the Word, through the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, equipping us for the seasons of our life. We look to you from which our help comes from. Jesus, empower your church as you did in the first century. Time is getting late. The signs of the times are upon us. Earthquakes, eclipses, and things of that nature. Lord, you said there will be signs in the stars, the moons, and the heavens. Lord, you said that earthquakes and famines and pestilences would come upon your church. We would be here, Lord, for the birth pains of the Messiah. In Mark chapter 13, in Luke chapter 24, in Matthew chapter 25, you were very clear on the Olivet Discourse to look at the signs around us and amongst us. Father, we just look to Jesus today as we're living in unique times. Speak to us today, Lord. Empower us and encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. So I wrote this message. I know in school they've, they've changed some of your math, right? It's like common core math. Well, the Lord gave me this title, Uncommon Core Math. Uncommon core math. Uh, we can see in the scriptures, and I'll show you clearly, that Jesus appeared to 500 after he rose from the dead, 500. And he told the 500, go wait for me in Jerusalem. And we see, and I'll prove it to you in the scriptures, only 120 went. My question becomes, what in the world happened to the 380? And is 120 in our math greater than? than 500. Which group are you in today? Without the Spirit of God, I believe we can do nothing. As, a sh as we are ships without the wind, branches without sap, coals without fire, and we are useless, Charles Spurgeon said, about the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Church leaders, researchers, podcasters are all trying to figure out why Christians are only attending church 1.5 times a month. Why, I believe, because men have been using their own ingenuity to try and solve the problem by cutting services down. Drive through church. We might as well flip the communion wafer out the window. Drive through church. Oh, we have, we have gluten-free wafers at our church. Really? Okay. Try to solve the problem by cutting services down to less than an hour to accommodate for busy schedules or providing certain things that people will feel welcome and, and soften the message. There are some things, uh, putting on bigger productions, come on somebody, to attract more people. The church experts have focused on the culture uh, 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 and, and what the church lacks, but not one report that I read said, we need the Holy Spirit to come into the service again. Not one survey said that. I've been to many church conferences, as you might, Pastor Valco, and there's been an emphasis on follow-up and texting and all this other stuff and how to reach the lost. Let me tell you what the Bible says. The, the activity of the Holy Spirit is to draw people to Jesus. And when we do it, we get the results that are fleeting and we're wondering why. We need the Holy Spirit in our churches more than ever. We cannot be in the presence of God and be bored. When God comes, people will come. The great Christian writer E.M. Bounds, who wrote books on prayer, said this, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better machinery, not new organizations, not more and novel methods, but men and women whom the Holy Ghost can use, people of prayer, men and women who are mighty in God. People are so busy trying to figure out what we need instead of stopping to invite the Holy Spirit to come into the house of God once again. During our, our installation at ICC, Carter Conlin gave a message and he charged us and he prayed. Uh, the words to me were, honor the blood and honor the Holy Ghost. We must honor the Holy Ghost. We simply cannot exist as a church without his presence, commission by the Holy Spirit to do the things he's called us to do. 
31 things that the Spirit of God does. In Romans 8, 26, he helps us. In John 16, 13, he guides us. In John 14, he teaches us. In Revelation chapter 2, he speaks to us. In 1 Corinthians 2, he reveals things to us. In Acts 8, he instructs us. In Acts 15, John 15, he testifies of Jesus. In Acts 9, he comforts us. In Acts 4, he fills us. In Acts 13, he calls us. In Ephesians 3, he strengthens us. In Romans 8, he prays for us and through us and with us. In Romans 9, he bears witness to the truth, which is the word in Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians, he brings joy. In 2 Corinthians, he brings freedom. In 1 Peter, he helps us to be obedient to the scriptures. In 2 Corinthians, he transforms us. In 1 Corinthians, he lives in us. In Romans 8, 2, he frees us. In Titus 3, 5, he renews us. In Galatians 5, he produces fruit in us. Can you say amen? Can I keep going? In 1 Corinthians 12, he gives us gifts. In Romans 8, he leads us. In John 16, 8, he convicts us. In 2 Thessalonians, he sanctifies us. In Acts 1, 8, he empowers us. In Ephesians 4, he unites us. In Ephesians 1, he seals us. In Ephesians 2, he gives us access to the Father. In Galatians 5, he enables us to wait well. In Matthew 12, 28, he casts out demons. How can we possibly improve on the work of the Holy Spirit with the props of man? <sighs> Come on, somebody. Paul ended his Christian, his Corinthian letters with a beautiful closing, a doxology, he calls it, in 2 Corinthians 13, 11 through 14. It's called the benediction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss, and all the saints greet you. The grace, watch this now, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, of God, and the, doesn't say power, the communion of the Holy Spirit. Be with you all. That's interesting. Now, if you would have asked me what I would have written, uh, I would have guessed, I would have probably, you would have guessed me what Paul was going to write. I would have gotten it wrong. My Pentecostalism would have said, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you. But I learned something from this scripture, that there will be no power without communion. So Paul was saying, first step, make sure you have communion with the Holy Spirit, connectivity. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit, as one, uh, one version puts it. Paul connected fellowship, not with what we do with people, but what we do with the Holy Spirit. Fellowship means gathering and walking together. He was challenging the church in Corinth to step back into fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Now, that was the church. He, he talked about the 500. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. Three through six. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And verse five, and he was seen by Cephas, Peter, then by the twelve. And then after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part to remain present, but some, they have fallen asleep. Jesus gave the 500 instructions that would lead to the birth of the church. Exactly what did he charge them? Well, I found that in Luke. He said, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you would do endued with power from on high. I don't want to leave my house in the morning without that fellowship and the connectivity with the Holy Spirit. 500 got the memo. 500 got the text message. 500 got the tweet from the resurrected Christ. Those 500 had the opportunity to experience the 31 things I told you about. Some 40 days later, Jesus ascends into heaven and the doors of an upper room in Jerusalem where they will wait for the Holy Spirit to fill them with power. 
120 were gathered there in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. They returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath's journey. And when they entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, Judas, the son of James. They all continued with one accord. Someone say one accord. And supplication, that's prayer, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Here's, here's my question to us. The resurrected Christ appeared to 500, but there were only 120 in the upper room. What in the Lord's name happened to the 380? Now, I don't think the 380 were not saved or born again, but I know the 120 were. 76% of the people didn't follow Jesus' commandments. They said, Jesus, you're awesome. I, I believe I see you alive. You're resurrected from the dead. Great teaching, great fellowship, but we got this. We're going to go on our way from here. I don't think there's any more. Can I tell you? There's more. There's more. There's more. Why was Jesus telling them to wait for the power? Well, Let's ask another question. Why were these eyewitnesses unable to be witnesses for Jesus? Because Acts 1.8 says, when you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the, to the uttermost ends of the earth. I think if anyone would have had the qualifications to be a witness, it would have been the eyewitnesses who saw the bodily resurrection of Christ, the scars, the wounds. They saw Jesus as a corpse, and then they saw him walking through walls and then ascending into heaven. If anyone would have been qualified to get a church website, have an Instagram account, rent a school building, or maybe get some business cards, it would have been the 500. But my question is, why didn't they follow and obey Jesus? Jesus told them, wait, don't start anything up until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit to change you. You may have seen it all, but you haven't received it all. Woo! You've seen it all, but you didn't receive it all. 500 got the message, but only 120 would be empowered. 500 got the promise, but only 120 cashed in. 500 got an inheritance, but only 120 claimed it. Which group are you in? I was speaking to someone recently who shared he had a distant relative die, left him a boatload of goodies, and him and his wife were going to cash in and get the check on Tuesday. It was an inheritance, he said, it's going to change my life. Now, the old me would have been working him for a tithe. But I leave those things in the hands of the Lord as I mature. And he said to me, my relative's death and our inheritance will change everything for us. And I said to myself, how much more has Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and ascension give us an inheritance? The reality of who Christ is and what he longs to do, I don't think has hit their bank account yet. They live far below their true inheritance. It reminds me, just before I left Jersey City, they started filming The Sopranos in our neighborhood. And I thought, oh boy, this is going to be interesting. And so they said, well, we want to get your house in a shot. And uh, we usually, have, we, they have to pay you. You have to sign a thing for a waiver. And I said, uh, oh, yeah, that's cool. He said, how much do you want? I said, I don't know, 50 bucks. He's like, 50 bucks, sure, sign here. I got the check. I said, that's D-I-T-O, Dito. Made out the check. Talking to my neighbor across the street, old man Zupa. I said, hey, Papa Zupa, how you doing? He said, I'm a good pastor. I said, is he here? Did you, uh, you sign off on the waiver? I said, yeah. He said, how much did you get? I said, 50 bucks. He said, oh, you still not. He said, I got, I got 3,000. I said, 3,000? I went back to the guy. I said, deal off. You didn't. He goes, you were the easiest one on the whole block. He goes, we go up to 7,000. We're authorized to go up to 7,000. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Oh. He said, if you asked, we would have offered more money. Sometimes we go up to six, 7,000, but you were the easiest person. Some of you said the born-again prayer cashed in your $50 check. 
and took off. I want to tell you there's more. If you want to be part of the 120, there is more. Somehow 76% of that initial gathering of the majority felt they could do without the upper room experience. They wouldn't, today we're not much different. A.W. Tozier said this, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on. And no one would know the difference because of the production methodology. You, you know what I'm talking about. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everyone would know the difference. The North American church, relying upon the nuances of man, but God is going to come back and saturate his church with his presence. The first church at Ephesus faced this problem. Acts chapter 19, they had a church, wonderful services, accurate teaching, but there was no Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Well, I believe, Pastor, that these 380 that didn't go to the upper room, they dispersed in various places. And in the Bible, could it be that by the time we get to Paul's third missionary journey, he comes across some of these people? How do we know? In Acts chapter 18, verse 24, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the spirit. He taught accurately and in the things of God, although he knew only the baptism of John, immersion. Paul came to town, and Paul must have got the realization this is where they went. Here's the 76%. And so Acts chapter 19, 1 through 3. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, oh, you following? He said to them, did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? Have you been filled with the Spirit? So they said to him, we didn't even hear about there was a Holy Spirit. Ay vey. He said to them, and then... What were you baptized? He said, unto John's baptism. The fact is, they didn't even hear that there was a Holy Spirit. Espirito Santo. Rahua Kokodesh. And they were disciples. The problem was the preacher, Apollos. He did the church of Ephesus a disservice by keeping the disciples in the dark about the Holy Spirit. And going down the path of Apollos, no, we need the Holy Spirit. Now, the best place to start looking is to start is looking how God first introduces the Holy Spirit in his word. Remember, I've been teaching you about the law of first mention. It's in hermeneutics. Denise, you'll be studying that soon. Hermeneutics and the law of biblical interpretation. There's ten laws. One of them is the law of first mention. So we get the word praise or baptism or Whatever it might be, you go into your concordance and you find the first time it was mentioned. And so here, the Holy Spirit is first mentioned in Genesis 1 at creation. What do we learn? If you listen, you can put up the attributes of the Holy Spirit. The attributes of the Holy Spirit. We learn in Genesis 1, he's moving. How do we know that? Let me read it to you in Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Are you with me? When you first see the Holy Ghost, he's not stagnant. He's moving. He's not sitting around. He's active. Are you with me? Don't tell me that this Spirit that's moving on the inside of you, but he won't move during worship. I think they were listening to some of the songs last night, Benji, at the, um, at the, at the wedding. And we saw some people enjoying themselves, and Eric's like, if they ever yell at me again for dancing in the aisles, I'm going to let them have it. <laughs> and he goes, I better see them with their hands raised tomorrow, dancing to the Lord. I said, hallelujah, Eric, you have my permission, right? Don't tell me that the Holy Spirit doesn't come in your life and doesn't in some way alter your behavior. Come on, somebody. The moving spirit moves men. Number one, he's moving. Number two, Genesis 1, 3, he's speaking. God said, let there be light. And then all of a sudden there was light. 
when the Holy Spirit moves, watch this, the word comes. When the Holy Spirit moves, the word comes. When we worship, we invite the word of God to become active in our lives. Worship should not be the thing that takes over the church service so that we miss the word of the Lord. But where the spirit is moving, the word of God will be spoken. That's why these ministers now, pastor, they have TED Talks. And they, they, there's no scripture in their sermons. Why? Because there's no spirit in their service. Oh, help me, Jesus. Nowhere to be found. No Holy Ghost. No worship. It's a production. It's a production. And from the production, um, the, when, 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 listen, when the Corinthian church is arising amongst us, folks, I want to give you eyes to see and ear, uh, ears to hear and, 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 and fine-tune your spirit to the Holy Spirit. And you know that the Word of God is going to be preached here in its totality. You know we give room for the Holy Spirit to move during worship. The Word of God combines with the Spirit of God. So what? He's moving, he's speaking, and number three, he's defining. Ooh, when he moves, he speaks. When he speaks, he defines. Can I prove it to you? Genesis 1-4, and God saw the light, it was good. He divided light from darkness. He called the light day. He called the darkness night. So one was evening. And one was, one was evening and one was morning. When he's moving, the next thing he does is speak through his word. And when he, this is man. This is an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Let me define some. This is a fish. This is a bird. Let me give you some definition. He's defining. God's word brings definition. Where there is definition, there will oftentimes be separation. As God moves, his spirit brings order. We see here, when God starts moving, he starts speaking, and he starts naming things. He puts things in their proper place. When C.S. Lewis became a Christian, he started writing Christian books, and he was asked about his old erotic writing material. <laughs> his response was something like this. I can't write that stuff anymore. There's a difference between soil and dirt. If you're planting seed in the garden, you put it in soil. But if you take the soil out of the environment it was meant to flourish in and put it on the table, it becomes dirt. Uh-oh. Once you're a Christian, can I tell you, the Holy Spirit starts renaming some things in your life. That's why Ephesians, uh, Galatians, I'm sorry, says don't quench the Holy Spirit. Your tongue is like a hammer. It can build or it can tear things down. Are you with me? For example, sex outside of marriage is not love. God calls it fornication. Money under the table, God calls that stealing and evasion. My body, my choice, God calls it murder of the unborn. That didn't work out too good with the vaccination crowd. But my body, my choice. Oh, it's okay over here for abortion, but it's not okay here for medical freedom. Uh-oh. I just offended you. Order. When it don't make sense, it don't make sense. The Holy Spirit's constantly moving. The Holy Spirit's speaking. The Holy Spirit's defining. We all need the Holy Spirit. But what lies ahead, hear me now, what lies ahead cannot be done without the Holy Spirit. Paul exhorted us in the next slide, Lizzie, in 2 Timothy 1.14. It says, that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. I, I love my Baptist friends, Pastor, and I feel so bad for them. You know, they just don't have the operation of the, everything is through the word. And you heard me say before, my friend, I won't name him, won't name him. I'm not sure he's my friend. He might be a friend of me. But, you know, I, I, he goes, no, God only speaks through his word. I said, really? How did you get your calling into ministry? Was that in Ephesians? Uh, Joe Smith? will be called into ministry on April 4th, 1973. Was that in the word? Uh, no. Well, then how did you know? Well, I, I said, how would you marry your wife, uh, uh, Leslie? I said, did it say in Deuteronomy, John Smith will marry Leslie Jones on April 14th, 2007? How did you know? I said, my friend, 
there's an operation that you don't even know is going on, and it's the witness of the Holy Spirit that's operating inside of you. He leads, he guides, he prompts. He puts the brakes on some things, come on. He puts a check in your spirit. I said, you were called into ministry because the, the Holy Spirit led you. And you, you knew that was your wife by an inner witness because God said, come on, you know. And he was like, yeah, you're right. I'm like, I'll make you a Baptocostal yet. The Spirit lives inside of you. Let's look at four truths about the Holy Spirit that we need to carefully guard as we move forward. It will help us prepare for the fight that lies ahead of us. Because let me tell you, folks, don't worry. The fight is fixed. We win. The devil will tell you something different. But I'm here to tell you today the fight is fixed. And we win. But he'll do everything in his power to convince you that the sky is falling. And it might be. But I belong to Jesus. And either I'm going by the grave or by the rapture because this is not all there is. And now, do we want to live a long life for our children? My daughter's 17, going on 27. And so, yes, we want long life and we want our grandchildren. We, but the times and the seasons are in the Lord's hand, amen? So we need to trust him and continue to do what he's called us to do, be salt and light. Uh, and it will help us prepare for the fight that lies ahead of us, a fight we're unable to face unless we cry out for that forsaken fellowship. Just a few points. Number one, he is my seal. He is my seal, and I don't mean Sea World seal. I mean a seal. It was sealed. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.13, in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. That means at the moment of your salvation, it only happens once, so don't come to the altar 14 times like I did to get saved. You can only get saved once. You could be sanctified over and over. Uh, sometimes people don't understand. It's not a salvation issue. It's a sanctification issue. We all struggle with stuff. And so when a moment I'm born again, shoo, the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence on the inside of me. Man, do I, did Chris change instantaneously? Nope. It took about three years to get the old Chris out of me. But you shouldn't be 20 years into your walk still behaving like a carnal Christian. Oop. Huh? Huh? Cindy? No? no? Well, it doesn't mean we're perfect. doesn't mean we're sinless. But it does mean there's a growth and a propensity to sin less. And that's where you have accountability in your life. And that's where someone can mentor you and coach you and pour into you and walk with you and take you through the scriptures and help you grow in the area of your gifting. But if you're a lone ranger, you will definitely become a lone stranger. Mm -hmm. A seal was an emblem that expressed ownership. You knew it was manufactured because the item had a seal on it. There was a seal on the most famous grave in history. Jesus' tomb was sealed by Rome, the most powerful uh, organization on the planet. The seal was saying, you cannot touch this body, it's property of Rome. Well, <laughs> you know how that story went. Let me add a, a, a nuance of the resurrection story after the Sabbath. As it began to draw towards the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the tomb. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. He goes, no, Rome, this ain't your property. I know that's your seal. But this guy's been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead reigns in your mortal body. That's some powerful theology. And I say, Lord, I'm all alone. He lives inside of you, folks. And that's why the communion of the Holy Spirit for me, it's breakfast. You know, I might not feel it right away. Someone said to me a few weeks ago, I was just slugged. They said, take one of these Red Bulls. And I remember Pastor Anthony, and I'm like, I do not want to be cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs on a Red Bull. Pew, 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 pew. I said, but I'll try it this once. And I tried it, and the effects were immediate. I was like, Bing, zzz, 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 like Bugs Bunny. But when I take vitamins every morning, Focus factor, C, 
B, magnesium, D, fish oil. Can I keep going? When I take that off, I don't feel that immediately, but it's in me working. The same thing, the Holy Spirit's in me working. He's not dominating me or controlling me, but I'm careful not to grieve him or quench the Holy Spirit, as Paul said. Number two. Well, so number one, if you're saved, you're sealed. Come on, somebody. And so you have to develop that communion with the Holy Spirit. How incredible to realize the Christian is sealed with the Holy Spirit. We have God's mark of ownership. He does the devil. You may, you may poke them and prod them like you did to Job, but let me tell you something, devil. They belong to me. They have an inheritance, and it's heaven. Well, I'm not sure. I'm, and that's why, Pastor, you're here to help people understand the assurance of their salvation. I don't need to be saved 146 times like my first year in Christianity. Every time I ran down to the altar, I, I have something going on in my life that's not copacetic with the Bible. I must not be saved. That's a lie. It's not a salvation issue. It's a sanctification issue. And we as the church need to be set apart and holy. Why is the nation collapsing and the culture collapsing and theft and all this other stuff? Because, because evil, evil is having its way. Evil's having its way. And the church has lost its salt and light and become a place of entertainment. Not this church. Hallelujah. You know, I wonder why we're growing? It's because we're, we're being steadfast in the Lord. Steadfast in the Lord. Are you with me? Number two, he's my pledge. Ephesians 1.14. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. A pledge is a down payment. When I was growing up, I didn't, we didn't have credit cards. You had to be rich to have a credit card. I would go to Walmart and Sears, and my mom would put something on layaway. 20 bucks. And I would hope we could put a 20 spot on it every week until we could, what, redeem it. <laughs> they would hold it for you. We'd come back and put the money. But, of course, um, I didn't get the realization until it was paid off, right? And by the time it was paid off, it was out of style. Come on. But that down payment was a promise to Sears that no one else could purchase that Cabbage Patch doll. How many people remember Cabbage Patch? I was like, that was, a, that was the first Thanksgiving fight was the raid on the Cabbage Patch dolls. Oh, my goodness, I'm dating myself. The Greek word for pledge is arabona, which uh, is defined as an engagement ring. When I put a ring on Denise's finger, I let the world know she's taken. We have a future date set and a life together. In other words, honey, this ring is a deposit of our future. But that's not all there is, because you hit the jackpot, baby. When I'm saved, I'm pledged. And the Holy Spirit, listen, folks, this is not all there is. There's a marriage supper being prepared for us, so don't get comfortable with the ring, because we have a date set, and it's called the rapture of the church. I'm working on a seven-part series for Wednesday nights in September that will take us through the seven next events from the rapture, to the tribulation, to the second coming of Christ, to the, to, to the Armag battle of Armageddon, until the judgment seat of Christ, until the white throne, until, the, the, until the, the new heavens and the new earth. And then I'll be preaching a series this summer. My first time, I'm going to do 26 weeks of a biblical worldview, and I'm going to go through the alphabet, and I'm going to make sure we have a wonderful foundation here at Parkview. A is for atonement, B is for Bible, C is for Christ, D is for discipleship, E is for eternity, F is for forgiveness, G is for God the Father, H is for the Holy Spirit, I is for Israel, J is for Jesus, K is for knowledge, L is for love, M is for money, N is for the new birth, O is for obedience, P P, P. Forgot. Prayer. Thank you. P is for prayer. O is for obedience. 
O, P, O is for obedience, P is for prayer, Q is for quarreling, R, repentance, S is for sin, T, It bothers me that I can't remember it. Yeah, it takes a lot of focus, but I, I'm supposed to uh, have a photogenic memory, but now that I've hit 50-something, T is for temptation. U is for the unseen providence of God. V is for being a good volunteer. W is for worship. X is for X chromosome. You know where that's going. Y is for bridging the young and old gap. And Z is making sure you have the zeal of the Lord. So that's what the Lord has put on my heart. And I know it's very different. I usually preach either topical or characters or expository preaching. And then we'll have Pastor Valco, Pastor CJ, Mary, maybe Eric, uh, and, you know, uh, give them uh, uh, a pulpit schedule here at Parkview so you can hear the word of the Lord, not just from me, because I don't want to be the focus. I want Jesus to be the focus. Amen? Number C, he's my comforter. There are people here today that you really need the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Um, you can get it from man. You can get it from my wife. I can get it from a counselor or a pastor, but it's fleeting at times. Uh, but when it comes from the Holy Spirit, when you have that core development with the Holy Spirit, and you say, you know, he, he, he will make intercession for you, my friends. The Bible says, and I will pray, Jesus speaking, John 14, 16, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, and he may abide with you forever. Folks, the Holy Spirit is in you. The word comforter makes me think of my mom when I used to come in and put my feet up on the couch. And she said, get your feet off the comforter. Now, my grandma's house, they had the plastic coating. <laughs> what is the sense of this? But I never knew. The word comforter means to walk alongside of. It's not just for walking, but it's for fighting. And four times in the book of John, the Greek word paraclete is used to describe the Holy Spirit. According to this book I read by Gordon Dalby, paraclete was an ancient warrior's term. Greek soldiers went into battle back to back. So when the enemy attacked, they could have their backs facing so they wouldn't get blindsided. And let me tell you, God does not send you into the fight to fight the good fight alone. He gives you a partner, and that's the whole. When you don't know what to do, just in the morning, Holy Spirit, I need you today. I do it every morning. Holy Spirit, I need you this week. It was a long, tumultuous week. He covers our blind side. In Luke 4, 1 through 2, Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness, 40 days being tempted. Jesus, our forerunner, gave the lesson during his temptation in the wilderness. Jesus, full of the Spirit, faced Satan himself and left in victory. And notice what happened to Jesus as he exited his fight with Satan. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, Luke 4.14. 4, when we're full of the Holy Spirit, too, we can face any battle that's ahead. Not only that, but we can also leave stronger than we went in. And I know that the Holy Spirit being back-to-back -back with me, it became uh, particularly uh, important in every aspect of my life. Every aspect of my life. Fighting and struggling and... Um, God was with me every step of the way. Why? Because I have a comforter who's living inside of me. But I have to tap into that. I have to tap into that. Last one, he's my helper. He's my helper. The same, and the Bible says this. Listen to this in Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray as we should but the Holy Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. <laughs> Sometimes it's like so overwhelming in life 
things happen. Lord, I don't know what to make of this. I, 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 I need some outside help. I need supernatural wisdom. I need grace. I need strength. I need all of these attributes of the Holy Spirit to be operating. Give me the mind of Christ because I don't want to mess this up. Teach me your ways, O God, that I may walk in them. And the Holy Spirit will begin to lead and guide you. The greatest Christian on the planet said he did not know how to pray. If the Apostle Paul didn't know how to pray, then we certainly have challenges in our times of desperation and our need. Our first prayer meeting when we planted the church on the south shore of Staten Island, there was five of us. One guy who never prayed, but he just read the Bible. He brings this guy from the street who was filled with all sorts of demons. And the guy just got out of the hospital, and he, he, he invited him to the prayer meeting. I thought, oh, my goodness. He says, we're going to pray for healing. Now, let's be honest, Pastor, I didn't have a good track record for healing. Uh, there's a good chance if I laid hands on you, nothing was going to happen. I just uh, was very young in the Lord and didn't operate in that office yet. Um, but I said, oh, geez, I don't know how to pray. Um, and then I realized the Scripture says the Holy Spirit will help me. I know Paul didn't only give us bad news that we don't know how to pray, but he gave us good news that God takes our ask and makes it bigger and better. In Ephesians 3.20, now who to him who is able to do more abun far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think, according to what? The power that works. Who's the power that works in us? Back to the Holy Spirit. Paul was saying, go ahead, ask for something. Say anything. And the Holy Spirit will get, up, get it right. Sometimes I'm mumbling, Lord, I just, my daughter, oh, Lord, ooh, I feel she, oh, I just want to help me, Lord. I want to power it, but I just, it's out. Bro. You know, you got autocorrect on your phone. Sometimes it's annoying, isn't it? I'm glad the Holy Spirit can take what I thought I said and autocorrect it and bring it to the Father. And I said, Lord, please be, I wanted to choke this. Lord, and the Holy Spirit goes, Father, he didn't mean that. He, just, he was just praying for patience. But he does the autocorrect. Are you with me? Ah, are you with me? Hallelujah. He makes them bigger and better. The only prayer that fails is the prayer that's not prayed. Tonight we'll be praying at the Dream Center at 6 o'clock. For, for just the continuance of what God is doing in us, through us, and with us, right? When Elijah uh, was praying to God, remember we talked about at the end, he said, Lord, I'm no good, just kill me. And the angel showed up, and he probably took his prayer and said, he, he doesn't mean that. He says, and then the angel came down with the cake and the water, remember? And so, so, so the angel said, Lord, he doesn't mean kill him. He's hungry, and he's cranky. He needs cake and water. And so the angel comes back with cake and water. He took his prayer, his complaint, and he said, Father, I think I know what he really needs. That's, he, he, is, he is the editor of our prayers, the Holy Spirit. Father, this is what they really meant to say. I say things that are so dumb sometimes. But I thank God the Holy Spirit edits my prayers. If he didn't, many of us may have married the wrong person. You may have been in a situation Oh, Lord, I love her. I want to marry her. And the Holy Spirit goes to the Father and says, nah, she's just saying she's lonely. You don't want to make that mistake. Uh, no wedding bells for that one, Lord. Not yet. When someone prays, I don't care if they died. The Holy Spirit means, goes to the Father and says, what they meant, Father, is help me forgive them. Are you with me? When someone cries out, God, I don't trust you anymore, the Holy Spirit interprets that and says, Father, they're, they're frustrated and they're having a problem understanding what you're doing in their life. Be patient with them, Father. When we pray, it's our words. But the Bible says in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit takes them and edits them and makes them powerful. He's our seal. He's our comforter. If the worship team could come, he has been entrusted to you and I. Remember the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship 
of the Holy Spirit is always available. When I get up in the morning, I, I kid you not, and I'm not trying to over-spiritualize things. I go down and I open up my Bible, what I'm reading. I'm reading a book right now for my devotional. And I said, Lord, I just want to take 15 minutes and center my life around you this morning. I put on the worship music on the iPad. And then I go and feed the dog. Then I go and make my daughter's lunch. We all have routines, but I have engrafted the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit down in the kitchen in the morning. In fact, it starts in the shower, uh, and I got to keep the music on low, but it starts in the shower as I'm brushing my teeth. I want to have that communion and that connectivity because I want to be centered with the Holy Spirit. Let's stand. Hey, put that last slide up there, Lizzie. Hey, if, you're, if you need comfort, you need help, you may be struggling with something that's overwhelmed you, well, trust me, I've been there, taking a step of faith, doing the name and center. I was like, God, if you're not in this, we are in trouble. You could be overwhelmed in any aspect of your life, your finances, your relationships. But can I tell you, the Holy Spirit who abides in you will help you navigate through. If you need prayer, if you need prayer for comfort, if you need prayer to understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that he's your helper. I want to pray with you. I want to have you saturated with the Holy Spirit. I want you to get a fresh touch from heaven. I want you to be able to experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, now's the time to say, you know what? Holy Spirit, empower me. I want to take a step of faith today. And I want to experience the Holy Spirit, not just from the words on a book, but in the residence of my heart. As we sing, Pastor and Bob and Nancy, and uh, our prayer team could come forth. Uh, if you want to receive that, you want to be prayed for, you need a, a, an additional saturation, you need a healing touch, the Holy Spirit's available for you today. Amen? So come on up as we, as we close. If you need prayer. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait, you're coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her room, we'll be church ready for you.
Hallelujah. You just raise your hand for the blessing. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, the one who seals us, who's pledged to us, who comforts us, who helps us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your activity in our daily lives. We draw close to you this morning. Holy Spirit, help us cultivate that communion in the morning, in the evening, in the car, in the cubicle, wherever we may be, in the gym, in the walking, in the coming, in the going. Teach us to cultivate that relationship. Empower us by your Spirit, Lord. For those that are struggling, Holy Spirit, I pray for a double portion of your Spirit. I pray for the baptism of the Holy Ghost on those have, who have not yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The fire and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Touch them in a deep way that they may experience their what next in Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. We love you, folks. Have a safe trip home. God bless you.